Welcome to Goalie Science, the podcast where we try to bridge the gap between the theory and practice around all things goaltending and sometimes hockey too. I'm Ben Sertic, and as, um, as always, I'm here, Jerry Phelps. Hello, Ben. Uh, I noticed that your audio is not as good as mine today. That had a devastating loss in the Ben Sertic <laughs> household. Uh, my microphone decided it no longer wanted to continue working. Uh, and so apologies of this audio did get magically saved by our editing software, but I believe, so I'm assuming right now everyone's listening in and I sound crystal clear because our editing software is taking it. I really hope so. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do if it's bad. As the person who presses upload and then export on our editing software, I really hope that it works. Oh, and now suddenly I am in widescreen. Yeah. Uh, wow. And way, way better definition if you're watching on YouTube. But enough about Jamie's camera and enough about my audio. Hopefully it all holds up. Uh, today we're going to talk about what's going on in the hot world a little bit between the NHL draft that just took place just over about a week ago uh, and a little bit about free agency. And then most importantly, because this is what everyone hears to hear about, Jamie, is some behind the scenes stuff on what those two events feel like from being a player. Uh, and again, I think you've probably told these some of these stories somewhere online that someone has heard of, but probably. I think... I might, I might just know them because I've heard them from you yourself. Yeah, uh, probably. Yeah, I, probably that. But um, my story is a little bit more different. Everyone's got a different story, and mine are yeah. interesting. But let's uh, let's talk about this past NHL draft as well as what's going on a little bit. Free agent frenzy uh, was started July first. Okay, so quick uh, summary statistics for those who weren't keeping track of goalies in the NHL draft this year, we had 26 goalies drafted in the NHL, which is the most since 2018. If anyone remembers the 2018 draft, that was the 29 goalie draft, which is a lot of goalies, Jamie. A lot of goalies. Like on average, historically, if you look back the last 20 years, it's on average like 20, 21, 22 is a pretty common number range. Uh, yeah, 29, 2018, and then 26 this year. So lots of goalies taken. Uh, Six Canadians on 26, and four Americans. I want to get that right. Yeah. Four Americans on 26. So North America making up less than less than 50% of the goalies drafted this year. Um, for what it's worth, and I do think this is important, this draft class does represent goalies who would have been most affected by the wiped out COVID season, probably. So this is the, like, the CHL goalies who would have lost their entire U16 season in Canada. And... By extension, um, a pretty significant year that would have been affected in the U.S. And that's not to say that other countries weren't affected by the pandemic, but we can only speak on where we live, right? So, yeah, I do think that's relevant. I think we saw that in, like, the OHL generally had a lower output of, of drafts in the NHL this year. And I think a part of that is just, like, how much hockey were you able to play in your most formative years? Wow. Take with that as you wish. Now, you were more but, more dialed into some of the, the discussions online, especially the statistics, uh, the hockey world, the statistics world. Um, you know, we have talked in the past about how Hockey Canada, despite everyone's loud opinions, Hockey Canada and hockey in the goaltending development in Canada and the United States is not, is not broken. It's working just no. as intended. But someone might see this stat and say, well, make nine Canadians, four Americans out of 26, 26? Six Canadian, four. Six, it was ten six Canadian. So 10 total out of 26. Um, mm -hmm. Still making up less than half. Is something wrong? And, and I, well, I'm curious. I have my thoughts, but I'm curious uh, on yours outside of the, the pandemic affecting development. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the thing that I learned the most recently is that no two teams and no two scheduling departments, no two front offices view things the same way. So... Um, some teams might be more hesitant to just take a CHL goalie in later rounds just because they've seen them really clearly. Like at this point now, people really know what the quality of some leagues are, right? Like you're watching WHL game and there's variation year to year, but like you know what you're getting out of the product of the WHL. You know the standard. Um, there's enough of enough. You've seen enough people play in those leagues to understand how the high quality that they are. Um, and so I think some teams are more willing to take risks on goalies from different leagues, right? So like there is, and, and there's a really interesting, um, there's some interesting articles in different sports that talk about like FOMO, drafting FOMO, mm -hmm. uh, where people have a fear of missing out on the latest trend. So if you go back and you look over the past 10 years at NHL drafting goalies, uh, 
when Bobrovsky broke into the league, he wasn't drafted. He was played in the Russian third league when in his first NHL. Your league. favorite stat of but, all time. Yeah. Yeah, but there was an increase in goalies that were drafted out of that Russian third league uh, afterwards, right? Because it's like, oh, maybe if someone's playing, you know, even if it's pro, he was the third league, they're playing pro at 18, maybe there's something there. And so we saw an increase in those goalies. We saw the same thing after Connor Hellebuck's, uh, like, pretty meteoric rise into a starting goalie where he was picked out of the NAHL. Uh, and so we've seen a big uptick since that in taking goalies playing in the NAHL. Especially in like the fourth, fifth, sixth round, where historically teams have less success anyway. So it's like we you you feel more comfortable taking a gamble because the safer pick has historically not been good either. You know what yeah. I mean? So I think that's what we're seeing. And I think again, I think unfortunately for Canadian and American goalies, um, I think at some point teams are more interested by the league that they have less of an evaluation on or uh, just less viewing time, right? Like you might just play 55 games in, in the OHL and a team might have just seen you enough and they're, and they're not interested because they've got a big enough sample. So there's, it's weird where it's like we see some goalies who don't play a lot of games get drafted because, uh, you know, you have a smaller sample and you've looked really good in that sample. It's it's all complicated, to, to say the least. Yeah. What do you think on us? Yeah, there, there's a bunch. So I think that FOMO, I, I actually didn't read that article. Um, but that's something that I've always kind of, you see the trends, like you'll see French Canadians or you'll see Finns or, or Russians uh, and Swedes. And so there's always been like, you know, usually it's a block of like four or five years where there's been a plethora of goalies coming out of a certain demographic. And that's just, I would just put that under the FOMO and that, I like that. I like that term and using that in terms of a, a drafting perspective. Uh, for me, there's a few things. Um, the first is that I would say you, you you had touched on that where teams know what they're going to get for the most part out of major junior. Like, you know, you got a bunch of kids that are 16 to 20 years old. Now, when you look at the European side of it, there's a massive upside where you can get kids that I'm saying kids as they are kids that are 15, uh, 15 to 20, that, that junior age that can go and play professional hockey. And this is high level hockey that, former NHLers play in and you get them exposed to a higher level and a higher skill level at a younger age. So development wise, there might, they might be at an advantage long-term uh, or short-term, excuse me, than some of these, these major junior goalies because they're, they're seeing, they're getting um, more exposed to, to better quality play. And also with that is if you look at the kind of the sample that you get from most North American or, or me, we're just going to talk about major junior goalies and we're not, I'm not going to go in the college route, but you pr actually probably throw, throw college in this as well. You're typically going to expect, you know, that those player, those goalies for the most part can step on a major junior and, or college and play in the East coast, play in the American uh, AHL. And they'll have that development years, which we've talked about. Do they need it or not? That's a different story. Let's go back to whatever episode, whatever that was 37. Uh, a couple of a couple of episodes ago, I mean, the goalies actually need the American Hockey League or not, but it's kind of uh, like par for the course if you're a North American goalie, where you have to like you're probably going to go play in the minors unless you're like Carey Price or Marc Andre Fleury. Whereas the European goalies, they you look at other Europeans, they're like, okay, so I, we've had so and so has played in the SHL, mm -hmm. and they've made the jump right away, so we can assume that another goalie that is doing equally as well in the SHL should be able to make that jump. And so there's less of a, you know, more of incentive to draft someone that is probably going to be able to step in and play right away. Um, you also have to think about where in European goalies have the advantage in terms of they can always go back to Europe and make a lot of money and play hockey for the rest of their lives without a cap on the number of Europeans in the European leagues. And just like there's not a cap on the number of Europeans in professional hockey leagues uh, in North America, if you're a North American, there is a cap on the number of imports you can bring in. So you are sort of handcuffed as a, a North American in that sense. So I'm sure NHL teams know that it's a lot harder for North Americans to leave out of major junior and still like, and you go overseas and come back, whereas they can go and sign American League deals or East Coast deals. And then you get, okay, well, we didn't draft this guy, but he's turned out he's actually playing pretty well in the East Coast League. Let's let's sign him. And so you don't have as much urgency 
Whereas if you want to draft, you want to get your rights on a European goalie before anyone else does because they're already playing well in the professional league, you kind of are almost incentivized to draft Europeans more so than drafting a North American goalie. Yeah, like I'm looking at a really good example of that is like uh, the Ducks at the end of the second round took Damian Clara, six foot six Italian goalie. Uh, he played this past season in under 20 in Sweden, but he dressed for Farstad in the SHL to play. But he also played two games in the Hockey Albenskin League. He looks like he's currently, according to his league prospects page, low on Debrinus in the Albenskin League. So he's just drafted and he's going to play in the second league in Sweden next year, right? Yeah, and that, that was a league I was trying to get into as my career was ending, and I'd already played 50-something mm-hmm. American League games. I'm like, I'm trying to get into this. And now you have a kid who's 17, 18, yeah. already playing there. So it's like, yeah, like I would probably it's, take it's, him. I would probably draft him too. Yeah, it's it makes a ton of sense, especially, and you know, we've talked about this a bit and a little bit of the work that I'm doing now looks at pathways, right? Like what's the pathway that a goalie needs to take and you have so much more flexibility if the goalie's playing in the second or first European league. You can, especially as an 18, 19 year old, right? Would you rather have your goalie playing professional hockey in your system or would you rather him playing in the CHL? And I think teams think differently and I think they think different about each prospect. So it's not like a one size fits all model. But I, I do think it really provides like a, a great develop. You want to talk about development, right? You're going to, and again, it's a different game, right? European ice, there's going to be a transition back to American ice. There's all these things. We saw that with Askarov this year in Milwaukee, who is transitioning from that European ice to an American ice style game. And there's still things to learn, but you you have more flexibility, right? Especially with that. So I think that is kind of where things are trending and it's not Canadian or Americans goalies fault. This is the way the system is. Yeah. Right? And I, th- yeah, like Askroff's a, a really good example. I mean, he's been playing, he was playing in the KHL for a number of years before coming over to North America. There are former NHL guys that play their entire NHL, like careers in the NHL, and then finish up in the KHL. They're still playing at that same quality, yet he's been playing since he's probably about 16 or 17. And it just, that's, that's good for development. We, we've talked about how playing, being able to play at higher levels. And being able to lose at higher levels and learn at higher levels, uh, and I'm pretty. He played for CSK, right? Uh, at St. Petersburg, SK okay. St. Petersburg. Yeah. yeah. So like he's playing for one of the top two teams in the league, getting all the all the bells and whistles you could ever ever have, and all the long term development. Like that's you can't compare that to someone playing out of the North American League. You, you, you can't, and it's, it's and I'm saying like the NAHL, like a tier two junior A league, it's, mm. you, you can't compare them. That's why you said those are throwaway picks. And then the third, the last thing I want to throw in there that popped into my mind again is you look at where a lot of, actually a lot of the goalies getting drafted out of USHL and the NAHL specifically, there's not as much coming out, out of like tier two junior A, quote unquote, uh, and all except yours. It's, that's a bi- it's a big hit. <laughs> except yours truly. <laughs> But we'll um, get, we'll get, get to, that. to that. But um, a lot of them are Europeans, and there are yeah. more and more Europeans coming over because they see the value in terms of the NCAA as a viable route to develop yourself. Especially in you know we're we're gonna we you know to our European listeners we are gonna try to get more Europeans on. It's not something we're super well versed in, so that's why we don't talk about it as much. But um, it, it gives you more time to develop rather than going through the other the, the system of playing like June, yeah, U20 in, in like Sweden or Finland and then having to go play one of their levels of professional and then slowly getting phased out because the next crop of kids and next crop of kids, we can go to the NCAA and you get four years to develop and grow. And a lot of, a lot of goalies are coming over and you can see it now. Like we have, we have one Finnish goalie on our team. I think I would say like there are, I don't know the percentages, but it's probably creeping up to pretty close to maybe 15 to 20% of the goalies in the NCAA are European. And it's it's not that, that super, it's not hard to recruit them and they want to come over here and that is important. And they go play. And if we can get them to play in the USHL or the NHL and get them, which I'm a big fan of. So if you're, uh, if you're a European goalie or a parent of a European goalie and you're considering the NCAA, 
make try your best to go play junior A in the United States or Canada first because you can get a full year of adapting to the ice style. And like, so got the guy on was drafted out of yeah, uh, he played in all. He played yeah. Chippewa. He did not. They did not beat the Wisconsin Windigo. My 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 team that I worked with at the strength coach and goalie coach. So unsurprising. The unsurprising. Fact is bold. It, it is. It, it is real. But um, yeah, just a lot of Europeans, and it seems like more Europeans get drafted to those leagues than North Americans. Yeah, I mean the first three picks in this year's draft that were um, that were goalies were. I mean. Dion played six games in the USHL, but he was largely in the NAL this year. Uh, Rabel was in the USHL. Augustine, who I, truthfully, I was on Team Trey Augustine being the first goalie taken in this draft. Time will tell if how that plans out. Um, I think he's a really, really good skier. And he's the one at Tri City, right? Uh, no, he was, the he, was, he was. He was. He was on the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the goalie who uh, famously, until that in the World Juniors, had won like twenty five games in a row, mm. um, which is a pretty fun win streak. To have. That is a uh, trick. Yeah. Yeah. The I mean the NTDP won twenty nine, one and two this year. <laughs> and there were thirty three games. So they had a uh, good year. They beat us. Did the, yeah. But look, that was a really it was like, a really really strong like for the eight, program. Eight three. Yeah. That happens sometimes. Um but yeah, anyways. Long story short, like yeah, the top three goalies this year were uh American Junior A leagues. Yeah. So uh, again, it's also a big deal, right? Those leagues skew a little older for goalies typically. So I think that's a really good indication. You're a 17 year old starting games in the USHL or the NAHL. I think that does put you on radar. And that's no different than being in the CHL. You're a 17 year old, you know, getting being a starter. But that is a little more, maybe it's a little more common. We could probably actually look up that exact information. But uh, anytime you're again starting at 17, there's typically a reason for that. You're going to get looks just when you're playing a lot of games at that age in those leagues. Absolutely. Right. But Jamie, I wanted to transition a little bit into kind of your draft experience. I want to meld these some of this discussion with kind of your experience. I I really like uh hearing your your draft day experience, especially uh yeah, you know, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Let's go. I want to Especially hear- I know you're gonna say, especially Robin, who is my dad, his reaction yeah. to it. Uh, yeah. That's your favorite. Uh that's my favorite part of the story. Yeah. So I I do I say this every time and then I'm very open about it. being drafted is probably the worst thing that ever happened in my career. And if you're going to the NCAA, it's probably better to not be drafted at all. Um, or so the NHL second round. Yeah, or just be drafted way higher than the last round. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I getting drafted was not part of the the plan for me. It was just it was a thing that happened. So I had um, I was playing in the BCHL, and I had just gotten committed to Michigan Tech. I had ended up getting traded because the coach was not happy that I committed to Michigan Tech. So he was also in your 18, 19 year. So you're draft 18, plus one yeah. year. So draft plus one year. And so that was another story we can get. We can get into like, we should have a horror story podcast day. <laughs> um, and then so I, because of that, he kind of like handcuffed me and he ended up trading me to the uh, OJHL. And not like the best junior league in Canada. That's not where you want to go. So it was a little bit of a, a demotion. It, the way I looked at it was a little bit of a demotion, but. We were in a position to to play a bunch of games, and I think we had 13 games left or something. We had to win like 11 to make playoffs, and um, I just played all the games. We ended up making playoffs. Um, then we went to playoffs, and I think we lost. Like the first round was like a two to three. And we lost 13 something on the first game. Yeah, I, I gave up. Pretty sure I gave five. I think, oh, I have five, and then my poor goalie partner gave up eight to finish us off. And then we ended up coming back, winning that series. And then we played St. Mike's. And I was like averaging something around like 65, 66 shots a game. And I, I it was just one of those ones where you're just playing well. Like your body hurts. Your everything hurts. But you're just playing well. And it turned out someone from NHL Central Scouting, uh, the goalie, had a, had a goalie Central Scouting was there. And he was impressed by a couple of games. And he threw me on the list. And I didn't even know I was on the list. Um, a guy that I had played against who we had we had a couple of mutual friends in common gra- found my number and called me and he's like hey did you know you're on the he's like congrats for being on the draft list and all this stuff and I was like I don't know what you're talking about um Winnipeg was the only team to talk to me and they said are you going to the draft it was in like Pittsburgh or Philly and I said I'm no I'm not unless you want me to and they're like nah you could probably just stay <laughs> you probably just stay home uh so I did so I stayed home and each round went and I saw 
old goalie partners get drafted. I saw Winnipeg take Hellebuck, probably a smart choice, um, in the fourth round. And then it just so happened. And I actually just kind of gave up. The last round came and I was like, well, nah. oh, well. And I was at home and my buddy, David Freeman, shout out to him, just got engaged, um, called me and he's like, yo, you just got drafted. And, and Freed's is, uh, he's a he's a prankster kind of guy so i thought he was joking so i said shut the f up like that's messed up man why would you say that he's like no seriously i'm watching it right now and i guess like the nhl live ticker was ahead of the refresh on the internet which is what i was doing and then eventually i clicked it and it came up and my dad was out gardening in the backyard and i just yelled at the window like dad it's got drafted and he's like what the who and i'm like winnipeg and he just did like hot laps my <laughs> He was in 2012, so my dad was probably like 56, 55, 54, and he's just doing hot laps around around the lawn, like yelling and screaming. And it was like it was it was surreal, and I thought it was like the coolest thing since sliced bread. Um, so for me, like not everyone goes to the draft, not everyone gets that crazy experience. Some sometimes you don't even know, like you just get a call that it happens. Um, I know it's a little bit different now with social media and stuff and social media was still like MySpace was still a thing around that time. So, uh, <laughs> it wasn't like as soon as you get drafted, everything blows up. Um, but why, why I, you know, why do I say it was the worst thing? So it's, what I didn't know is that in the NCAA, if a team drafts you, you they have your rights, your entire NCAA career plus what, how it's plus free agents for yeah. NCAA doesn't start until August 1st yeah. rather yeah. than July 1st. So I went to tech. I didn't play a whole, I didn't play a whole lot my first two years because Phoenix Copley was there, a current NHL goalie. Uh, my, my last two years, I played every game except for one. And I was one of the best in the country. I was top five in the country for my last two years. And when I went to graduate, when I, my season was over, I called my, my agent and I said like, Hey, like, can I sign and, and go to the coast? I want to play some games here. And then, you know, just like, like most goalies do. And he's like, well, Winnipeg said they don't want to sign you. And I was like, okay, so what now? And that was weird because they, they were actually, they were really close to signing me in my junior year, uh, because a couple of guys got hurt and I was like a five minute decision away from being signed and just taking out of school early. And so this was like a weird, huge slap in the face. And I was pretty bummed out. And I was actually, I probably tried to text you. I was pretty close to just like quitting, going to med school, saying like, yeah. you know, I'm able to play hockey for one year just to say that I did pro hockey and, and then and then wrap it up. And um, so I said, well, why don't I just sign? Like, let me just sign with another team. Like I was, I was one of the best goalies. And essentially because I was doing so well, all the other teams just assumed I was going to sign. So no one ever had me on their list and they all, they pegged another goalies. So I didn't have any NHL deals. I was gonna, I was looking at signing an American League deal, and then eventually, out of nowhere, out of out of the need to fill a spot, Winnipeg signed me, and they signed me because they needed me, not because they wanted me. And so ultimately, that's not what you're looking for when you're looking to sign. You want to go to a team that like really wants you, and that we've talked about that before. But um, yeah, that's my draft draft story. It's not as positive as as <laughs> as I would have liked it to, but. I was still drafted. I still had the opportunity and not a lot of people had that. Um, it's just like hindsight, seeing, knowing what I know now in terms of opportunities and stuff, unless like if you're going to major junior or you're playing pro in Europe or something, yes. But if you're going to the NCAA, in my mind, it's not worth it to be drafted. You have way more opportunities if you are a free agent. Jimmy, I think, bro, there's a lot to unpack there. Huh. The thing that's not, not getting talked about enough is your 932 OJ save percentage when you were lending him three goals a game? Yeah, and like I know you were people, getting like, like forty, like forty-five shots a game, legitimately forty-five. Shots. Yeah, I I played really well when I went there. Um, I don't think really your save percentage. You had you were five and five. <laughs> yeah, I I just played really well, man. I, there's just yeah. there's just nothing about it. I just played, just played well. Um, yeah. Probably, probably the, some of the best hockey I was playing. I don't know, maybe I was playing like carefree and I didn't just, didn't care. I had already had my scholarship. I was like, well, well I can only go up from here. So let's just win some games. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't know that my, I did I actually, I ended up winning like top goalie prospects in that, in the OJ. And I had played in the OJ for like six weeks. Yeah. You had 11 regular season games, which is inspirational, really. Not Which enough. really, it really, it really is. And then we could also another another time we should talk about 
getting traded for get for committing to a university and that being wow. the reason you get you get traded actually no you get benched for a month with zero yeah. gas and yeah. then traded yeah i mean again we'll, we'll definitely dive into this more another time but like if you're a junior a team and you have two division one committed goalies like you're supposed to just enjoy that that's supposed to be like just a really nice bonus to have what a great problem to have yeah especially when you're losing a lot of games and you don't put in your other committed goalie to like maybe get some wins uh, and just like shake things up or just go back to four like yeah you know what we'll have a junior junior story day and that one will be the one of the icing on the cake stories because then one's like oh well politics and stuff and then usually i'm like yeah politics okay sometimes sometimes it gets you <laughs> yeah but i think that's like yeah i think that's really important um and again like i think looking back on a Winnipeg system there too is you take a goalie who's going to a an NCAA spot like same thing as going to Europe right you have like a place to store them for a while right yeah I'll try to that's really all it is it's like this you know draft and stash idea and that is one of the reasons why I think a lot of more teams do draft NCAA or junior A kids too is because you can have them for four years hey and if they pan out boom you look like a genius if they don't bury them doesn't matter they can't go anywhere else yeah, like for example, a really good one is like the Red Wings drafted a, a Canadian goalie, Rudy Jumal. Um, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, Rudy. I know you're listening. Uh, but he played at the Taft School, so he played New England Prep School. Looks like he's going to play in the USHL next year. He's committed to Yale, right? It's the same thing, right? You're going to six round pick. You know where they're going to be playing for the next little while, right? And that's ultimately, like, obviously, you had a really, really good run. They clearly saw that there was something there. And they're like, ah, don't need to worry about it for a few years. Right? You're having for six, yeah. six to seven years, you could have this guy, and he, he pops off. No one else can take him. And if yep. you don't need him it's at yours. the time he's popping up, doesn't matter. But if you need him, you can take him. And so that's a huge strong arm. And I wish that rule would change because I think that hurts. I think that hurts players. It doesn't. I don't think it hurts players because not only the thing that happened to me, but it happened to two of my teammates that I was playing with, both San Jose draft picks. Both drafted in junior, both went their whole career, like college careers. One had a little bit better of a college career than others, but ultimately ended up getting the thanks, but no thanks at the end of it, where if they were free agents, who knows what might've happened. Yeah. And I think this is something that is, I don't want to say being exploited, but it's definitely something that it is. It is. You can say it's being exploited because I, you should, it's the yeah. hockey is a hockey is a business. It's a business. And yeah. if you look at it, business in the terms of the capitalist set, like you're trying to exploit your, your your workers for the most amount of gain yeah so you're, you're supposed like, to like you're seeing you yeah like yes obviously it sucks but i'll admit that it's a good business move fighters yeah, that want to pick jets i would have done the exact same thing yeah exactly and that's like and i mean again i was gonna say maybe from a player side of things uh obviously this is not the first thing that gets brought up in player union discussions but it's definitely something that uh it should i mean yeah it, it should be yeah it should be yeah right because again this is um, yeah, and it's tricky, right? Like it's very, very complicated, and it's it's especially, I think it especially strong arms goalies, um, because goaltending, as we know, teams are hesitant to put in younger guys, right? Like mm -hmm. goalies between. I was reading a really cool report, or some preliminary data work on some goalie stuff that you can't even like include goalies between the ages of twenty and twenty three, um, in some of the data work to compare against older goalies because there's just not enough of them that play. Right, so we're, that's how few younger goalies. Whereas, like okay. you look at, um, you look at pretty much any forward, they're they're getting into the NHL like nineteen, right? Yeah. Like a good example is like even the Leafs, like the Leafs, like Matt and I's played in the in the uh, or yeah, it's not I think played in the playoffs, right? Mm -hmm. And after one year in the NCAA, um, that's pretty common. That would almost never happen for a goalie. Right? Yeah, and we, do, I think we've talked, we we've hypothesized a few reasons of why that is, but. I think my biggest hypothesis on that is I think goalies just need a lot more games played because players are really good and the NHL is really good and pro actually basically every elite level mm -hmm. of hockey is really good. And that transition seems to be harder for goalies to adjust and they need to have that body of work, that, that pattern recognition, that muscle memory, that skill, like skill acquisition. I can throw it every other term mm -hmm. I can think of, but they just need more exposure. Ultimately, yeah. more exposure than a player does to be able to adapt to the speed. And I yeah. think that that's what we see. And so that's why goalies tend to develop older. 
And with the game being faster and faster and faster, I think goalies, again, we're still going to be older and older. And that's why it's probably more of a push to grab guys out of European pro because they can play there for a long time or NCAA because you can still play until you're 24, 25 rather than grabbing a kid who's 18, 19 and they have to go play either U sports or go right to the minors. Yeah. Like for example, the Jets drafted Thomas Millich this year, right? Everybody knows Thomas Millich had this great story of the world junior team in Canada. I had a really great world juniors, but he's, he's 20, right? So he's drafted in his plus two year, uh, um, which means like I would highly suspect that he's not going to OA in the, in the WHL next year, but they're drafting him essentially equivalent of signing him as a free agent, right? In 10 pro. So he's going to go play. Yeah. Probably. In I mean, he's yeah, I think let's just going still. Yeah. But he's, he's currently listed as potentially going back to Seattle. Maybe he does. Maybe he does play an OA year in the WHL. Right. Um, and again, he's only played 91 WHL games. Um, no, it's not a lot game. relative to his age and his peers. Right. Exactly. It's not. And if we think that games are this really, if you think that game environments are this really important thing to develop, and there's definitely a sweet spot, right? There's definitely, yeah. you probably need to see enough games. You can do all the training in the world, right? But training is isolated. We talk about it all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that was something really interesting to see. I mean, I think it's a, an interesting swing. Um, sorry, I should also say that was 91 regular season games. He did have 44 playoff games. So oh, that's a lot of playoff games. So yeah. yeah, it's a lot. I mean, they had a huge run the past two years. Uh, but like again, it's it's so that that is a lot more. But it's still you know, 91 regular season games is truthfully not a lot, right? And so building someone up to you know the 55, 60 games in a full season before playoffs, which is is what pro schedules end up looking a lot like. And that's a separate discussion. Shouldn't goalies be playing that much in general? And I think that is changing. But yeah, this stuff is uh, this stuff is complicated, and it's really hard. Again, at the end of the day, it's kids, right? Teams are drafting kids, yeah. And, and yeah. how they project and how they are going to translate long term. I'll ask the million dollar question, isn't it? If we knew, I that, think that's. I think if we knew that, we would be sitting in a GM's office making deals. Yeah, we're working on that, right? And not so, studying congestive heart failure like I was studying. We can be doing fun things. Doing actual, actual fun things. Um, I still use that. Sorry, go back. Oh, I want to go back to kind of your story too. Nothing makes me laugh more than the idea of your dad double fist pumping Rocky style, hands in the air, backyard. That's how I've imagined it my whole life. I refuse it's actually to actually pretty happy. Yeah, all right, cool. Having it confirmed is way more fun. But... I still think that's, and again, like it's obviously looking back on it for your perspective now that unsurprisingly ended up not being the best thing, probably. But it was a cool but really that, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, I think, and I, again, and I think, you know, when we you look back, everyone stops playing it is. at some point, at, at, like whether at competitive sports end at some point for everyone. Yeah. Uh, but those memories are really valuable. I mean, we, we talked to today essentially was the hockey is a business and hockey is and why the business works the way it is, is complicated, but at least there are some positives. And I think, you know, for a lot of goalies and goalies who play a long enough time, you unfortunately run into a lot of negatives. Um, mm -hmm. And so it is nice to, to, I want to celebrate your positives for you, even if, you know. Yeah. And I, you know what, like the thing is, as I say, like, I'm so grateful for everything hockey's given me and the opportunities. Like I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't have, like, if it wasn't for hockey. And that's why I continue to to be involved in hockey and I'm passionate about it. But the thing is too, is a lot of times people often, when I remember when I was on the Trav, uh, the Spin Slang of the Biscuits podcast with Trav for Oilers, um, a lot of people, there's a lot of good, good positive things, but you also always remember the negative things. A lot of people were like, oh, this guy's just complaining and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, it's not me complaining. I, I can't do anything about it now. It's more of me seeing things, hindsight being 2020, and being like, okay, like I, I learned this from experience and from, you know, my negative experience. So I want these to be positives for other people. Like I want you to learn. I want you to understand the business. I want you to know because no one told me these things. Yeah. I didn't know. And yeah. there's nothing I can do about it. Like I'm not angry by any means. And what if it just paid me a lot of money? What if it just paid me enough money for me to go back to school and not have student loans? And yeah. for that, I am forever grateful. Right. Mind you, I can still drive at a old old car but really nice. i don't have problems and that's really important and yeah. 
So like, I'm never going to be angry at that. It's just, it's an unfortunate business decision. And I, if I was better, maybe it would have changed. And if I wasn't, who knows? And there's nothing you can do about it. So there's no point sitting there and wondering because that's, that's when you're angry. And I, you know, I was a little angry when I retired because I thought about this thing and it took some time to move on. And I want my, I want my experiences, both good, positive and negative to help other people. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important, Jimmy. Uh, I want to end on one thing. I don't know. This is going to be a random trivia fact. Can you ever think of a team, a just team, like a junior team of any kind, having both their goalies strapped in the NHL? Yeah. Because it happened this year, Jamie. What league? The WHL. So both Seattle goalies, both Thomas Millich and Scott Rasta, both drafted this year, like 10 picks apart. Oh, with the same. Well, I guess since Millich was drafted plus two, that would yeah. make sense. But typically, a goalie is drafted when they're 18, and then they're yeah. out of there by the time the next goalie is 18, and it, the cycle continues. But I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's there's definitely I'm sure there's definitely been teams where their starter was already drafted, and then their younger guy, or they traded and picked someone. Yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But both goalies in the same draft, pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah, I thought it was That's kind of a fun fact. fact. And I mean, obviously, and this is again interesting. So Millich played every playoff game, so Rasliff didn't play a single playoff game. Um, which is why when you, why would you try to compare goalies and why we try to figure out why goalies are drafted? You can't look at playoffs. No. You can't compare teams that don't get to play playoffs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought it was kind of fun. That was ultimately uh, a, a cool stat to kind of end on. But yeah, in conclusion, um, you know, six being goalies drafted, two of which from the same team. So not a, not a, so not a good distribution among the teams. It's kind of lost. So one, one of them, Seattle. one of them played in New England, and two of them played in Seattle. So fifty percent. Uh, but you know, ultimately, we'll see. And this is and Jamie and I before the, we started recording, we're looking at the 2018 draft, and so that's five years ago now. Uh, and there's some names on there you recognize who've gotten a lot of games, but there's some people on there who you know, don't. it's it's a business. And not everyone gets drafted. It's going to yeah. end. That's a reality that he knows for it's like a lot of free agents play in the NHL. Yeah. And we didn't even get into free agents frenzy. We'll get into that next week. All you need to know is that the biggest signing was Eunice Corpusal. So shout out to Eunice and so shout out to Caledonia born Cam Talbot. And we out here deal. Still kick it. Let's go. Two million to two million to LA for Cam. Uh just a lot of the silly cows. No trend of show. Yeah. We should get him on. We should, get we should maybe try to get him on. Was uh last last thing was Dan Turbo Caledonia too? Was he was a Hamilton? No, he was Hamilton guy. Yeah, yeah. Shout out the general Hamilton area for goalies born between 1986 and 19, <laughs> uh, 1995. We had a pretty good run. We did. So, we had a good run. Uh, yeah. And on that note, Jamie, I'm going to let you tell everyone why they should subscribe to not only your YouTube channel but most importantly your Patreon. Go ahead. Well. That's actually a sweet shameless plug because by the time you're listening to this, the aerobic capacity program has dropped on my Patreon. So if you sign up for Patreon, not only do you get all my cool goalie stuff, but you get a six week aerobic capacity training program that's going to get you into shape if you're struggling in terms of aerobic work before training camp. But uh, like, comment, subscribe to the podcast. It helps sharing it helps a lot to... Um, just keep supporting. We're getting a lot of people from all over saying they really like what we do. And and, and I've met a few people in the real world that say they like the podcast. And I think that's really cool too. So like, comment, subscribe, share, follow Patreon, everything you've got. Um, till next week, Ben. Jamie, until next time.